Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Allie. I've been a hospice nurse for about four and a half years now and I just like to do little videos um, based on hospice nursing and to give a little bit of education. Um, and today we're going to talk about symptom management at end of life. Um, we'll go through each of the major systems um, that I think are the most important and often most prevalent that patients uh, need more management at the end of life. Now this is not the end all be all. I'm sure there's more interventions out there and each nurse has their own little niche and maybe there's other things that you guys can educate me on that has been helpful for you guys. Um, but these are the common things that I've run into and I hope you enjoy. So we're gonna start off with our respiratory system, right? Cause breathing changes at the end of life. Um, my little note that I made, yeah. You know things like chain stokes comes along or um, labored breathing um, those are things that we need to manage as nurses so our patients have a comfort a comfortable journey on their way out so one thing you'll notice about breathing patterns is when the exhalation becomes longer than the inhalation that is one sign not the only sign that the dying process has begun and this process can actually start a week or weeks before you actually notice a patient start transitioning. Then the breathing can become irregular with things like chain stokes or um, like I said, those big deep breaths. What are chain stokes? Chain stokes are a period of rapid breathing. The breaths can be deep or they can be shallow followed by a period of apnea. So another thing about um, the breathing may become more, uh, sit more in the ribs right you'll notice the patient's doing that the the respiratory rate can be about 30 to 50 per minute and you'll notice especially closer to the end closer to the end of life like very close there every patient will be mouth breathing almost every patient unless they have issues so, like i said this isn't an exact science what do we do for chain stokes or any sort of respiratory issue that our patients may um present with during end of life such as shortness of breath or labored breathing, I should say. Well, it all depends on the patient's baseline before, so always assess that. But common things are positioning. Of course, you wanna uh, position patients to the side. Um, the fan blown over the body or you know, in proximity to the face. Uh, keep the drafts to a minimum. You can also do mouth care, oxygen, um, and opioids is another tool that we use for shortness of breath or labored breathing or respiratory distress whatever way you want to spin it, those are the things that we use as hospice to provide comfort to our patients. And we, you, sometimes you have to adjust the doses of the opioids or um, things like that or the oxygen level, but usually um, we can find a place to, a happy medium. Another respiratory issue we come in contact with at end of life is terminal secretions. And I've talked about this before, those that's the mucus build up in the back of the throat because the patient's unable to have that control now where they can expectorate and or swallow it. So what are interventions, nursing interventions you can do for terminal secretions? Uh, mouth care, positioning, a fan in front of the face. Medication wise, you can do atropine, levison, or Levson, I guess not Levison. Also do a scope patch. Now scope patches I haven't seen used a lot because their uh, onset is longer than the sublingual drops uh, or the sublingual tablet, but scope patches are, are used sometimes depending on, like I said, the patient's disease pro process. You're gonna see a lot more congestions in patients with congestive heart failure, COPD, um, you know, those types of disease process where their fluid buildup was already there prior to their transitioning or actively dying phase. So those are the things respiratory wise that you might encounter at end of life. If there's anything else. Okay, so pain management. This is like hospice's niche. It's our thing. We are all about comfort care, right? So pain management is huge at the end of life. And what happens when a patient doesn't verbally uh, isn't able to verbal verbalize if pain is present. You have to use things like the flax scale. Um, you also have to base it off of the patient's baseline pain before they were actively dying. What was their pain? Where was it located? Um, and what were interventions that they used to control their pain prior to that? Like, especially when a patient becomes N MPO, you're gonna use uh, Roxanol or the morphine sulfate concentrate, and you're gonna use Dilaudid. 
Now, nursing intervention wise to teach your families, of course, positioning, massage, uh, you can use heating pads, cold pads, but it, um, packs, but it, always educate your family on how long to leave those on and how, uh, what the frequency is that they can use them, but educate them on the massage, the positioning, um, things like that. So they, they can be involved somehow. And also, you know, of course, implement those things too. We don't want to be snowing our patients over with medications when, you know, positioning them to the opposite side could maybe just become helpful. Nonverbal signs of pain. What are those? Well, you're going to see restlessness. You could see the breathing pattern change, grimacing, road brow, like I talked about before. You can actually, patients will moan. Uh, those are some of your nonverbal signs of pain that you're going to see at end of life. And um, you're going to notice them. Um, you know, patients just can't seem to get comfortable. Their legs are moving, their arms are moving. They could be reaching out. So the next symptom at end of life is anxiety. And a lot of patients, uh, as you can imagine, do have anxiety at end of life. It is common, um, especially when they're getting close. Um, signs of anxiety, you can get that restlessness. You can also get labored breathing. The anxiety can be related to pain. It's kind of lovely how everything mashes together and you have to use your best nursing judgment. Um, things nursing intervention wise to limit visitors, limit time of some visitors, because some patients just need a quiet place to rest and some families just, you know, of course they're going to want to be there for their, you know, their loved one, but they, you know, we need to provide that therapeutic milieu as well for our patients. From other things, hand holding, massage, talking, having um, close family members talk to them to relieve their anxiety. And wise, you can always um, utilize Ativan. Again, before you start administering medications, always look at the patient's baseline prior. Do they have a history of anxiety? And what kind of medication were they using for their anxiety before? And did it actually work? You wanna use that before you actually actually try out any medications because if you're if somebody has been on one milligram of Ativan times a day for like four years I don't know if your Ativan 0.5 milligram is going to really touch them at that point uh, definitely and also always consult with your hospice physician or the primary care depending on what day of the week it is and what time of the night it is so the next um the next symptom we're going to go over is Elevated temperature or decreased temperature. So let's start with elevated temperature. So why does the uh, temperature increase at end of life? It's a metabolic change, not necessarily an infection. You can use the Tylenol suppositories, but you know that's a really invasive procedure to do at that point in that patient's life. Nursing intervention wise, the cool compresses, um, a cool a cooling bed bath, a Nice cool sheet drawn over the patient instead of wrapping them up in a hundred million gazillion blankets, because that does happen. <laughs> the fan, of course, if that doesn't work and the patient is still symptomatic. Now, when I say symptomatic, I mean, does the patient seem like they're uncomfortable because of this temperature? That's what you have to really look at before you do any sort of medication intervention, like the Tylenol suppository, um, if the patient is no longer swallowing. So just think about that. Is the patient symptomatic? Is this making them uncomfortable? And how high is the fever? And then of course, consult with your physician. Okay, so another symptom at end of life is restlessness. Restlessness by the patient moving their feet around, reaching out, different things like that. Uh, what are we gonna do for restlessness? Well, let's see what could be causing the restlessness, right? Um, is it pain, nausea? Could it be anxiety? Could it be a full bladder? Because those medications we're using at end of life can cause urinary retention. Not everybody gets a urinary retention. So um, you want to assess how your patient is voiding and make sure that they're voiding normally, of course. If, you know, if you're trying all your interventions to control their pain, their anxiety, anything you can always try and straight cat them. Let's say they've had very little amounts of urine in the past 24 hours and you know they they haven't had a saturated brief in a while or they've been dry all day so you can always palpate palpate that bladder see pushing down on that bladder makes the patient you know look for that those signs of pain does it feel distended and then of course consult with your physician to possibly get an order to straight cat the patient if it's over, I would say 250 mLs, usually the physician will suggest that you leave it in. 
uh, because it's just better safe than sorry at that point. Because 250 mLs is a lot to keep inside the bladder. <laughs> you know? Okay. Now, um, another symptom at end of life is terminal agitation. So, at terminal agitation is patients, it's like extreme restlessness, I would say. They're, you know, acting out in a way that they've never acted out before. Um, you can't... Little. You can't redirect the patient whatsoever. Um, none of your non-pharmacological interventions are working. So, and you've talked with the family, so you go ahead and you might want to try Haldol at that point. And depending on, you know, if the family's already tried it, what is the interventions that they've used already. And if it seems like they've been using Haldol regularly, you know, or they've even increased it based on hospice's suggestions um, and the patient's still terminally agitated, I would go ahead and send out a, send out my patient probably to a hospice house for the that 24 seven care, because it, for symptoms that are unmanageable within the home. And that's okay. You can't always do everything in the home. Not everything is gonna be you know, able to be managed in the home and we just want the best outcome for our patients. So the final symptom I'm gonna discuss is dehydration at end of life, which is common because our patients do become NPO. Like I said before, that's something that can also contribute to the buildup of the mucus up here with the terminal secretion. So you're gonna to wanna to do mouth care. Um, always consider your patient's swallowing status uh, before the actively dying phase where they on a downgraded diet, thick in liquids, things like that, because we don't want any aspiration pneumonia either, right? So we just want to do those mo mouth moisturizing techniques at end of life and, um, you know, keep them comfortable in that, in that sense. Now, a few things um, that I didn't discuss were in hospice, people, you know, a lot of our medications are sublingual. A lot of the interventions that I discussed today, the medications are either a sublingual tablet or drop, they're liquid medications, or they can be slurried, which means you crush the pill, mix it with a little water, and you draw it up in a syringe to give to the patient. Um, but another intervention you can use with your patients, they also, patients also have CAD pumps in hospice. And I've never, I don't know if you've, any of you have heard of a, uh, a CAD pump, but it's basically like a sub Q button and you can put medications in there. That way patients get the medications a little faster, more direct, and you can actually set it and patients can bolus themselves. And it's a pretty neat thing to have. Thing to have, our patients can get their medication more directly. You know, we can also check um, really easily how many boluses they've had in the past 24 hours and it, it helps us monitor that very well. So you can get medications like morphine, Dilaudid, right into the cat pump. That was my video on symptom management at end of life. So I covered um, only, you know, the major things that I think I've encountered at end of life. I apologize if I missed anything. It's hard when you're not in this situation to think of everything that you've gone through with every single patient. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I know it was kind of like a little teachy talky. So I tried to think of everything that I could have possibly encountered on my way, on my journey with my patients at end of life. I may have missed some things. Every patient's journey is different. Like I've said a hundred gazillion times, every patient's journey is different. So everyone has had different things that have helped them out. But the main things are pain control, um, breathing. You want to keep their breathing nice and easy. And um, just keeping them comfortable, of course. We want to respect our patient's wishes um, up until that very last breath. Okay? So I hope this helped. And my next video is going to be charting for hospice nurses. And this isn't going to be just at the end of life. This is going to be every visit that you're going to do or your comprehensives, things like that, so that our patients will qualify for hospice. And we'll go into a, that a little bit further, further on. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.